I told you this was complicated. When I installed my EV charge point back in March, I enlisted the help of both an electrician and also a professional charge point installer in Charge DV. Scarcely had I put my video out on the 11th of March. Within a matter of minutes, I had two comments to say the charge point installation was non-compliant in breach of the electrical regs. I'm going to show you in this video why and update you on a few other things that have happened since the video. So pretty much immediately after I posted the video, a couple of eagle-eyed people pointed out there were problems with my install. The guys at eFix, whilst thanking me for my, the shout out in my video, pointed out that the RCBO connecting the charge point needs to disconnect both the live and neutral conductors. Around about the same time, I also had Mick in the comments pointing out to me that my installation was in breach of BS7671, Regulation 7225313 requiring that the RCD disconnects all live con conductors, including the neutral. Same point as eFix. In essence, that RCBO that I showed you in the first video should have been a double rather than a single pole. Mick went on to recommend Fusebox or Luden, who both produce consumer units with double pole RCBOs. The point here is, which I didn't realize before um, we embarked on this process, the manufacturer of the consumer unit also needs to supply the component, internal components, principally the RCDs and or RCBOs. I think it's a breach of electrical regs not to because there can be incompatibilities that would render the unit unsafe. So two interesting things came out of this. So the first thing I did after discovering this was contact my electrician. Now he's not a charge point installer, so he can't really be blamed for this problem. And in fact, he told me something really interesting. The wholesaler who supplied him with the consumer, with the live consumer unit, supplies several of these each week to charge point installers. So you have to assume from this that charge points are being installed with single pole RCBOs incorrectly. But the point he made was all we were doing really in supplying the new consumer unit here in the garage and in the house was getting the job ready for the charge point um, installer charge DV. We were doing as much prep work as possible because my install was quite a unique one with a 65 meter cable supplying the consumer unit in the garage from the house. The next thing I did was contact charge DV to tell them we had a problem. Their head QS guy got in touch with me a few days later to say he'd found a double pole live RCBO and would come around personally to install it. And that's exactly what happened the QSs for both the north and south divisions of Charge DV visited this week, and I'll let Simon explain what he's done. Effectively, we converted the single pole RCBO into a double pole isolator at this, at this end. Uh, still an RCBO, so it's 40 amps. Comes off the buzz bar, so if we remove the cover, the uh, buzz bar all the way through to live terminal, and then neutral loop back to the top neutral bar, and then the cables are fed from there down to our charger. So that's all well and good. You might say, well, why did they miss this point? Well, you can't really blame Charge DV completely for this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the Indra charge point, which I've had installed here, which is one of the better ones on the market, is, I understand, one of the only charge points, I don't know, is it one of the only charge points? You let me know, that doesn't have a double pole type A RCD built in. If it did have a double pole type A RCD built in, does that follow that you wouldn't have to be so worried about having a double pole RCBO in the DB in the supplying the charge point? I don't know. Seems to be that way to me, but you guys who know a bit more about this than me, let me know in the comment section below. The other point is there's nothing on that RCBO itself to explain whether it's a single or double pole. Now, I suppose it's a bit of a giveaway that this RCBO being a double module is probably also double pole. But some manufacturers are producing double pole RCBOs in single modules, which makes the issue of identifying whether it's a double or a single pole RCBO very difficult for installers. And actually, you have to sympathize a little bit with installers here, because do you remember that point I made at the start, that all of the RCDs or RCBOs in the consumer unit need to match the manufacturer of the actual unit itself? Well, a lot of charge point installers are turning up on site with an existing consumer unit, customers reluctant to change it, probably because it's perfectly good, but they've got to try and find RCBOs that are compatible with those consumer units. Unless, of course, they're putting a new distribution board on the outside of the meter box. But there remains a, a beady question, which a couple of people brought up. 
Well, the juice pointed out that by having a 30 milliamp time delay on both the house and garage RCBO, and therefore no selectivity or discrimination between the two, you can get nuisance tripping on the garage board. So on a sub main light mine fed from a TT earth spike system, it's best practice to fit a 100 milliamp time delay RCBO at the house supply end to resolve this. Now, Robert chipped in. God, do you know, I just love the interaction I have on the comments section. It's the best part of running this channel. Robert chipped in to say it shouldn't be a problem as long as the electrician hasn't exported the earth from the house to the garage. But the problem is, as what the juice suspected, I think the Sparks has. Because what he's done is he's earthed the metal sheathing on the armoured cable in both the DB in the garage and also the house. I think as out of protection in case anyone accidentally cut through the cable that runs between the house and the garage. This hasn't been resolved yet, I'll let you know in the comments section when I sort it out, but I suspect what I have got to do is change that RCBO in the house board for a 100 milliamp time delay. But the problem is I've looked on the live website and there doesn't appear to be one. So this problem is going to run for a little while longer. So let's just move on to a couple of inaccuracies in my original video. The first point I made is that the supply that I had at the time, bulb, had gone bust. Well, a lot, few people have pointed out to me that bulb hasn't gone bust because technically it's in administration at the moment. It's fully operating. And I did actually find out at the time, which I think I pointed out in the video, that even though bulbs in, in administration, you can switch tariffs to, for example, an EV tariff, should you wish to do so. The next question a few people have made, which is again a point that I questioned in my original video, is having a charge point installed and buying an EV actually worth the cost? Simon said, what are the savings? Too much effort with huge limitations. Well, a bit of an update for you. Since I did the video, I might have mentioned it at the time, I've swapped over from the Octopus Dynamic tariff I was on to their EV tariff, which gives me electricity at seven and a half pence per kilowatt hour between half past midnight and 4.30 in the morning. I've set the charge point to only charge up the EV during that period where I get 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour electricity. And if you look at the Indra app charging history since I did that, on a typical off-peak four-hour period like Sunday 26th, four hours took on 27.3 kilowatts at two pounds. And if you look at the month in total, filling the car up four times, 309 kilowatt hours for a 78 kilowatt battery cost 21 pounds 90. So given it costs over 100 pounds now to fuel up a car in one go because of the exorbitant price of electricity, at the, electricity of petrol and diesel at the pumps, I think actually it is worth having an EV if you've got off-street parking and you can find a reasonably priced EV and get your charge point installed at not too high a cost. The other point I made which was inaccurate is I said that DNOs will upgrade your fuse free of charge. Mine Western Power did, but it depends who your DNO is. And Lee made that point here that he got charged for his fuse upgrade. Thanks Lee for getting in touch. Final thing I want to talk about today was solar. I mentioned in the charge point install video that having installed the charge point, it sort of made sense to start thinking about whether I should install solar panels and battery storage. Well, since I did the video, I spent the last 32 days or so stripping the roof down because all the tiles were, were disintegrating. I've replaced the roof membrane and all the battens and the tiles. Um, you might have seen my last four videos documenting this. And a couple of weeks ago, I installed solar panels and the company I got them from has since visited to hook up the inverter and also the battery storage. So that's pretty much what I'm going to say about uh, solar. I've rambled on for almost long enough today. The only thing I would probably add is that the Indra app has a micro generation function where you can pass surplus electricity into your car. But as the inverter itself is limited, I think mine is 3.3 kilowatts. You're only really going to be charging the car at just a little bit more than the power of a standard three pin plug. I'll give a little bit more information on that when I do the solo video. There'll be eagle eyed pedants out there looking to poke holes in this video and you've probably seen this. Yes, it's a plastic gland. I don't know why my Sparks installed that. He knows he's got to change it, but I thought I'd mention that today in case anyone has an issue with it. And again, there's a great video by the guys from eFix on how to correctly gland an SWA. I'll link that in the description below. That's really it for today. I hope you found this useful. If you have, it'd be great if you click the like button below. And also, times are pretty challenging at the moment for us creators. Uh, YouTube revenues are massively down. So if you did find my videos useful and thought you'd like to support me, head over to my Patreon page. We've got an amazing Discord chat forum. 
uh, free monthly giveaways, live videos, that sort of thing. I'd really value your support. And finally, if you're new to my channel, it would be awesome to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. Don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.